All right, so I want to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Hoffman, one of the uh, newest St. John University uh, PhD in Literacy uh, graduates uh, to the talk today, where we're going to be looking at how do you convert or flip a dissertation into a journal article. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing today now that you're graduated? After graduating, I took on a new position at work where I do a lot more with professional development, mentoring teachers, uh, working more with STEM education, uh, which is very exciting. I do like coding a lot, teaching some of the engineering projects and so forth, but a lot more mentoring, a lot more professional development, being in front of a group, a lot of presentations, dig digital presentations. So that took a little getting used to. It was a lot more time, a lot more planning, a lot more uh, interacting with staff and supporting them. Which is something different altogether if you think about it. Whereas years ago, we went to school to teach children or adolescents, and now oftentimes we teach adults. <laughs> so let's get into the first question, which is, what do you think are the inherent difficulties that lie in that conversion process of taking a dissertation that might be 200, 250 pages and turning it into a 25 page article, for instance? It's a great question and I've thought about it a lot. The hardest part I think was knowing when to begin. Should I have been thinking about this while I was writing my dissertation? Should I have been organizing it in the same structure framework that the journal is organized? Should I have a certain journal in mind? And so forth. So I think the hardest part was when. And then should I wait till after I defended? Should I wait till after I finish the edits uh, from after defending and so forth? So deciding when was, was one of the toughest things. And then there was some decision making that was involved with uh, writing the article. My dissertation was quite large, if you remember. <laughs> I seem uh, to quite, remember reading it a few times, certainly. It was quite expansive. I, was, I really uh, combined a lot. So there was a lot of decision making. Should I include all those components? Should I include the survey, the interviews, the microethnographies into one article? Or would that best be served in two or three articles? Absolutely. So, uh, so I, I, I second what you said in terms of uh, a design, right? So much like you had a research design for your dissertation, there really needs to be some brainstorming and, you know, logical reasoning involved in how are you going to, how are you going to split up, differentiate, select certain aspects of your larger study and put that into a smaller piece? And to what extent can you split that perhaps to get the best bang for your buck for two, three, or however many journal articles? Exactly, exactly. Okay. But those were those decisions. And then how to go about co-authoring a paper. In the past, I had been approached by former professors who wanted to co-author a conference paper or present with me. Uh, so I had never really taken the initiative to do that. So I thought, let me learn a little bit more about that. And when do I initiate that? Do I initiate it after I've written the paper, when I'm in the process, and so forth. That's so a good point, because if you think about it in hindsight, some people can just publish an article, for instance, from their literature review, right? So like a historical analysis on a topic, and does that really have to wait until after you defend your paper, or can you go ahead and, and try to get that published so that when you finish, you might ha already have a couple of publications on your CV or your resume? Right, exactly. And, of course, you're also under the, the real-world time crunch of, I need to finish this bad boy up, right? That was basically <laughs> the goal. That was part of the decision was made for me because that last year was just pounding the pavement and mm -hmm. trying to get it done while working full-time and being there for my family, but still doing the best job that I could. Absolutely. So the second question is, what do you think about and the differences or the nuances involved in terms of how is the style of writing different when you write for a journal as opposed to a dissertation? I think they have some similarities, both 
uh, dissertation and a journal, they have the basic parts of a research paper, the basic parts of a study. Uh, you're still being asked to write in a concise, understandable manner, have some true, uh, smooth transitions in between the parts. But then uh, the journal articles and the journals that I studied uh, differ from the dissertation and they differ from each other. So that was very interesting to see. They differ in terms of their formality. Some are very formal and written from the third person and parting research and so forth. And others are more informal from a first person. Here's my journey and here's the thought processes, my interests and so forth that went along with this. And, and I know that you're a well-studied individual when it comes to selecting uh, a suitable journal for a publication or trying to submit to a particular journal in particular. And so do you think that writing for, you know, writing for a journal and submitting a, jour a journal article is a linear and or a formulaic um, type of writing that you can sort of study it uh, do a backwards design and deconstruct that idea and then sort of fit your your project into that model? And do you think that that's uh, an appropriate way to do it? Or do you think oftentimes it's, it's more of a creative approach? Well, I think it depends on the person, the researcher, the writer. Uh, and I think, I think you can do both. For me, I'm a little bit of both. I can be very linear and everything's on a grid and I have to map it out and then ex be able to explain it, compare and contrast, see the quantities and so forth. So I can be very linear and mathematical and then I can be very imaginative and creative and think, what's the best way to present this? What's really going to capture my audience's interest? How can I make my reader want to continue? That's well said. So, so. It's, it's those points where uh, maybe you should take risks. It's just a matter of when and, and where, uh, exactly. you know, in that regard. And I think <clears throat> I've been doing more and more of that. I think I've mentioned to you in introductions to my journal articles. And I see it as, you know, we've always been taught that, that there is this formula and you want to attract <clears throat> uh, readership from the beginning. But I almost write in a more informal or loose fashion in the intro to really ensure that people understand what I'm trying to say through using analogies and a, and a host of other types of informal language to draw them in. And once they get interested, then we can sort of go back to, uh, I guess, traditional ways of uh, writing a research paper. <clears throat> the third question that I wanted to look at is, how do you believe you can continue to grow and improve despite having uh, or despite not having a supervisor now that you've already graduated as a emerging academic in the field? Right. Uh, that's a good question, too. I definitely thought about that since graduating. After I defended, summer began, and I really felt now I'm on my own. Everyone's off, and I have to chart my own path. And I had this wonderful support system for the last four years with uh, working with you and my committee, my professors, my cadre, and suddenly I was on my own. So it definitely took some adjusting, even though I had been on my own before graduate right. school and I had done some things uh, before as well. Uh, but it took some adjusting and it, and it was good. It gave me a chance to really reflect and think, how do I most want to spend my time? What do I want to do with the, these knowledge, the knowledge and skills? That I acquired and I took some time to learn from others that I really hadn't heard from. I started reading the Chronicle of Higher Education mm -hmm. they had a section called Vita. So I got to hear. Can you say the name of that section one more time? I didn't quite hear it. Oh sorry it's called Vita. Vita okay. Uh, like short for I'm thinking short for curriculum Vita mm -hmm. and it um, I read pieces short pieces from other people who had recently graduated from doctoral programs and some of the things they warned against uh, and some of the things they encouraged people to do. Some, some of the pieces were very funny. So it was really a great way to step outside my comfort zone and see what else is out there. 
I expanded my membership in STEM professional organizations and read their journals that I really hadn't read before. And I started reading the journals, not just to think, well, how would this fit in my uh, literature review or how will this fit with my study? But I started reading them to think, how did this researcher organize the article and how did he or she write the article? How did, did they include themselves and talk about their interests? Was there a theoretical framework? Uh, I started really looking to see how the articles were in, in and of themselves. That's an excellent point. I think um, one of the ways that I've developed in a similar capacity is by studying CVs and or academic lineages of different experts in the field and seeing how did they develop, right? So, you know, maybe uh, Tim Rosinski, for example, wasn't always into fluency, but he stumbled ac across that topic in later years. So that sort of gave me um, confidence that I didn't have to have everything already mapped out and answered in year number one. And it was okay to engage in sort of wide research to see really what interested me and where I wanted to take my career path. I think that's a really good point. I think that's what that kind of thinking led me to think I need to have some kind of attitude, uh, some kind of way of thinking about things. When I was in graduate, graduate school, my attitude was no excuses. Okay. Never give an excuse. You just hand in the paper, you know, no, no one wants to hear about the dog or what else is going on at home. We, no we love those kinds of students. <laughs> you got to get it done. You got to get it done. Um, you can tell your, you know, other people, but you got to get it done. So I think, I don't know if that attitude works now. Now my attitude is more, I'm going to persevere. Just like you said before, it's a learning experience. And I'm just going to give myself permission to try new things. I tried new things at work and uh, I evolved and improved as a teacher and in different fields. So I give myself permission to do that now with writing the articles. Makes sense. And so specifically on the article you're working on, where do you think that that, um, uh, in terms of the, the process, what, at what stage are you at this point? I would say I'm past the middle of it, and I'm just looking to think uh, my the article is basically a mixed method study. So right now I'm thinking, how can I best mix my methods a little more than I did in my dissertation? I'm noticing that in the articles that I've read that have been published on mixed methods, that there's a, um, there's a more interconnectedness between the qualitative and the quantitative findings. So how can I further support qualitative, my quantitative findings with my qualitative findings in a way that flows and also, I had so many findings for my dissertation, so I really need to focus on ones that will most contribute to the field because there were a lot that reinforced and extended, and there were some that I felt were new and gave, would give people a new way of looking at things. But Plus, depending on the journal that you selected, the, some of the extant literature might speak more profoundly to the readership of one journal versus another. It could be, it could be related to the grade level range. I know you worked uh, with students grades three to five, I believe it was. Right. <clears throat> and so that might speak to upper elementary, uh, you know, into middle grades impacting what's done in the literacy classroom there. Um, whereas other journals might be more of a wide scope in terms of their readership or grade level expectancy of, of content. And so, again, uh, what you say uh, matters based on where you publish it, certainly. So I really want to, you know, I, I appreciate you joining us today. I know that it's a constantly evolving process to develop as a newly minted uh, PhD in literacy student. I will say on record, that you were an absolute pleasure to supervise. Jennifer, you're, you're an amazing scholar and I see nothing but bright things in your future. Oh, thank you so much. So um, everyone, I this is uh, Dr. Jennifer Hoffman. Uh, she's gonna be the newest, best thing on, in the literacy field in just a few years. 
and uh, kudos to you on that. And hopefully we can talk again really soon. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. All right, cheers. Thank <laughs> you.